Welcome everybody to this uh, panel on careers in international development. I'm joined by some really fantastic and interesting panellists. We've got quite a big panel tonight. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of them just to introduce themselves very briefly, um, say who they are and, and what their current job is, and then we can dive straight into the questions and hopefully get through, um, get through a few of your questions so that we have um, lots of time to do that. Um, so I'm going to start with Ella, if that's OK. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Ella Duffy and I work for the DCED, which stands for the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. So um, we help uh, different governments and development agencies communicate with each other and share knowledge on private sector development, um, which is, yeah, everything is where the public sector sort of works with to support the private sector. Um, and I am the assistant coordinator, so sort of in practice, my job means sort of setting up uh, regular meetings on specific themes with representatives from different development agencies um, and doing some communications work and then sort of drafting summary documents uh, on these sort of specific themes. Yeah, that's me. Great. Thank you, Ella. I really appreciate it. And Zara, I'm just going through in the programme order. So Zara, if you could uh, give us a quick intro to what you do. Okay, hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zara Kesser, and uh, I'm currently working um, at the United Nations Development Programme in Pakistan as a Youth Economic Empowerment Officer. Um, so I'm basically working as part of the Youth Empowerment Programme here, um, where I work with development partners um, to, you know, and in the development partners in the public and private sectors um, to kind of advance the economic empowerment of youth in Pakistan. And I, we do that through I, in particular, do that program management, research, and policy support, and um, partnership development. Um, and right now, I'm connecting from Singapore. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Katie? Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie. Um, I'm currently the head of monitoring and evaluation at an organization called Lively Minds. Um, we work in Ghana and in Uganda to we work with government partners to develop to deliver play schemes that are run by mothers and to kind of to improve the standards of early childhood care and development in school and at home. Great, thank you. And um, Janina. Hi everyone, yeah, my name is Janina Schnick. Um, I work for the Bilateral Cooperation Programme of the German Ministry of Agriculture. It says here that I work for GFA Consulting Group, which is the consulting firm that has been commissioned to manage this programme. So I'm a project manager for projects on sustainable agriculture and climate resilience. Um, and they're located in Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, um, Southern Africa, and Mongolia. Um, I've only been in this job for a year and a half. So I previously worked in Eastern West Africa for about six years, um, if anyone's interested in that as well. Thank you. And Ian. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm the CEO of Afrinspire, a charity, UK charity, which I helped create in 2002. And we relate to partners in East Africa. We have many partners at the grassroots level. Um, and we're very relational in supporting and empowering all these partners in the projects they're trying to do. So that's where we concentrate really on the ground in Africa is where the expertise is, particularly in Uganda, um, Zambia, um, also South Sudan. Um, and a few other countries in that sort of region of the world. Thanks, Ian. And Tori. Hi, everyone. So my name is Tori Ford, and I'm the founder and executive director at Medical Her Story. Medical Her Story is an international award-winning not-for-profit on a mission to eliminate sexism, shame, and stigma from health experiences. And right now we have over 100 volunteers are, and are in seven different countries um, working to advance gender health equity through patient advocacy, medical education, and storytelling. And then a bit more about me, um, I graduated from the University of Cambridge with an MPhil in health medicine and society in 2019. And I'm currently doing uh, my PhD at the University of Oxford in primary health care. So everything I do really focuses on feminism, medicine, um, and patient experiences. Right. Thank you, Tori. Um, and then last but by no means least, we've got Samira. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am a climate change specialist at the World Bank based in Washington, D.C. 
In this role, I co-lead the World Bank's climate finance tracking team and essentially help mainstream climate considerations across all the World Bank's financial products and projects and operations. And in addition to that, I've also worked on technical and advocacy reports related to climate mitigation, carbon pricing, and the water sector. Uh, these are, and then, uh, and to a small extent, the agriculture sector. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sanira, and thank you, everyone. Really glad to have you with us in such an interesting and diverse panel. Um, some of our students had pre-sent in already some questions um, when they registered, so I'm going to start with a couple of those. While we do those for our current attendees, please do put your questions in the Q&A box and then we can move on to those in, in a few minutes' time. Um, but we had a really interesting question, I thought, about how did you decide which organisation, which company, which charity you wanted to work for? Um, or was it just a case of, of luck and opportunity? Um, Zara, would you mind uh, starting us off on that? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, my first job, actually. Um, um, which was back in 2016 when I, I graduated uh, with a bachelor's in economics uh, from the University of London. Um, and at that time, um, frankly, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't even know much about the development sector at that point. Um, so, um, uh, you know, since I, I didn't have any idea what to do, what which sectors I could go into, I could go into teaching, I could go into, um, you know, banking, finance, I, I could go into the development sector. So development se the development sector was one of the several options that I had at that time. Um, and um, so I kind of, you know, discussed it with the career counselor at, at my institution um, and, you know, lots of other teachers as, as well as the alumni. And that's where I kind of learned more about the development sector. Um, and I connected with alumni who were already working in the development sector um, in, in private sector uh, consultancies, as well as the United Nations. Um, and from there, I learned of uh, an organization called um, Innovative Development Strategies, which was which is a private consultancy firm in Pakistan in the development sector. Um, and I, you know, I learned of a vacancy over there. I applied over there um, and I got that job. Um, and uh, that's where I started learning about the development sector. I, I worked on several projects. I picked up picked up on a lot of new skills that you don't really learn when you when you're studying. Um, and and then slowly, that's how I you know kind of uh, uh, learned more about the sector. And then eventually, I, I decided to go on to uh, do a master's degree in in development studies at the University of Cambridge. And I picked on on courses that I found more interesting, like gender education, etc. Um, and then when I came back, um, you know, I, I, I already had connected with a lot of alumni before before uh, going for my master's, um, and. Uh, one of them was working at the United Nations Development Program in Pakistan, and because I knew her um, quite closely, and uh, you know, I learned a lot about the kind of work that she was doing. She was working uh, with refugees, and she was working with youth as well. So that's how I kind of, you know, obviously we all knew about UNDB, but that's how I kind of learned more about the work that she was doing, and I found it really interesting. Um, and so when I came back, so uh, you know, I connected with her. Um, and I, you know, kind of spoke to her about the different vacancies that were there, what kind of work she was doing. And then there was a vacancy that I came across. I found it really interesting. Um, I applied for it and um, I, you know, did a lot of research about obviously the organization as well as the role that I was applying for. And I think it was also really useful that I um, kind of discussed it with her as in how the application works, how the shortlisting works. Um, how the, uh, you know, what kind of questions uh, I could be asked in the interview. And that really helped me prepare for the entire process. So that's, and then that's, the, I mean, I got the job and that, that's the role I'm currently in now for about three years now. So that's kind of how I landed into this current job. So it wasn't really thought out, but it kind of, I kind of, I mean, in a way went with the flow and, you know, talked to a lot of people, um, I've connected with a lot of people, did some networking, and uh, did my own research as well, and that's how I landed uh, into this job. 
Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Really interesting to hear and it, it. It sort of reminds me of someone who said, you know, your career makes sense in retrospect as you're going through. Sometimes it's not always quite clear what direction you're going in. But when you look back, you kind of go, oh, yeah, that led to this. And then I spoke to that person and it all kind of connects up. Um, we, were, we were talking about this just before the session. And I know, Ella, you had quite a different journey, didn't you? Yeah, I think definitely a little bit different in terms of how I ended up um, sort of in this in this job specifically. So um, I, for, for a bit of context, I did a, a, my undergraduate in geography and then I did do a I had a year out doing other stuff and did a, did do a master's in development studies. So in terms of being in sort of the international development sector, that progression sort of made sense. But the role I'm in now, I actually found through the Cambridge Career Service um, and it was sort of completely complete luck that it sort of came up at that time it's not a, it's a really small organization that I work for so jobs don't often come up and it was sort of the exact right timing um I graduated from the development studies masters in 2020 so just just a few months into the COVID pandemic and I'd been planning to move abroad and go to Canada uh, and be a canoeing instructor for um a summer and then potentially just stay in Canada um so I was yeah that was obviously not an option with COVID so I was sort of looking for a reason to stay in Cambridge um because I'd only lived there for a year for the master's so this job came up um at the right time and in Cambridge and it let me stay here and experience more of the city and it's also in the sort of sector that I was looking in so in terms of sort of um more sort of luck <laughs> luck perspective that's that's my journey yeah thank you so much and it it's funny isn't it? it's that combination of luck and planning which helps us end up where where we do um thank you both it's really helpful to to hear your story um we, we've had a couple of questions actually about sort of related and i'm going to club them together that came in in advance which is about the kind of mindset that you need for for work in this field and also overcoming some of the challenges and some of the disappointments and, and managing to stay positive in, in the face of all of those. Um, and I think Ian, you were saying that you, you had some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, so on, on the mindset one, um, I just jotted down three things really. Um, one is to have a passion. I think having a passion helps uh, if you're working in international development. I think patience is really important. And I also think finding your focus. So that's the sort of mindset um passion patience and finding your focus that's very brief i think the 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 other question i mean these are great questions um and the one about uh, it being such a daunting challenge you know how do we how do you keep hope and what about being discouraged um it's very true i think um most of my experience is in africa and the middle east and um also when you're working with the poorest people in the world uh, and you look at africa as as an issue you could say the poverty in africa it is a massive issue and a massive problem. If you only look at it theoretically or abstractly, then it does seem an overwhelming challenge. On the other hand, it's probably the biggest challenge in the world. So I, I really started to do Afrinspire when I was age 50, and I'd already had a successful career and achieved a lot of things as a civil engineer, irrigation engineer, and in commercial business. So I'd already achieved a lot, but this was something I felt was the biggest challenge so that's it actually interests me rather than being daunting i think it's a challenge that you can say look you know this is something we really need to work on so i think i, I just turn that around not be daunted by it um the the other thing about the enthusiasm i am enthusiastic and i still have passion and i was at an event in birmingham with um the master's course for international development at birmingham university talking to one of the lecturers and as he talked to me he said but you're still enthusiastic and he said, I'm, I've just lost it all. And he'd spent 20, 30 years, if you like, working, particularly in Latin America, actually, totally different career to mine. Uh, and he'd become cynical and disappointed and disillusioned. And I thought that was such a pity. Now, I think one of the reasons why I stayed positive is I'm working directly with people. And I started off my career working on very big irrigation projects all, all over Africa. And it was very abstract. It was more like working at a high level. And I, I deliberately changed to focus on individuals because I believe development happens around people. And therefore, if you can relate to people directly on the ground, which I started to do, Africans I grew out of that sort of personal connecting to some of the poorest people. And that's motivational. Um, and the only time that where I feel despondent is actually complying with like all the financial systems 
There's a lot of compliance in international development. And every so often the banks just stop you in our tracks, stop all your accounts, want to investigate you before they'll open everything up again. And that is just so terrible. We're not doing anything wrong. We're actually doing really good stuff. But you have to constantly battle with these challenges. And many of them are sanctions, you know. Um, I mean, well, I won't tell you, some people won't deal with us because just because we're in Africa, not for any other reason, but they don't want to get their fingers burnt by being involved in Africa. So you have to sort of fend off all these things in order to keep going. And there are many, many times when Afro Inspire could have just stopped in its tracks, but you press on. So you have to work hard and you have to deliberately try to get through these things that would stop you. Um, but then you, then you do, you manage to get through them. And that that helps you. So yes, it's full of pitfalls and there's many disappointments. There's many things working against what we're trying to do. Um, so, but anyway, you keep going. So I, I've maintained my hope, I've maintained my passion. And I, a lot of it is, I know that sitting here in Cambridge where I am, I can change a life a day or sometimes many lives just by literally working from this desk in Cambridge. It, it's remarkable, but it's true. So if I, that's the motivation every day with, uh, because I spend my time interfacing constantly to people in Africa with emails coming in, WhatsApps coming in. I mean, I have more landing on my desk every day and I can, as long as you act on it, if you can act on it, then you can have an impact and you can support somebody, empower them because it's their work, not, not mine. Is that helpful? I think it, I hope it's helpful. Well, I could certainly see a lot of nods amongst the other panellists, and particularly when you were talking about the challenges, there were people kind of nodding away in, in the background. So I certainly think uh, that that has resonated with our with our other speakers. Um, Sanira? Yeah. No, uh, everything that Ian said has resonated with me. Um, but I would like to add to the questions because there were a couple of uh, points that I would like to make from my experiences. Um, in addition to what Ian said, uh, in terms of the mindset that should be kept for a career in international development, uh, I think it's extremely important to bias yourself with multiple perspectives. There is huge value in that. And there are two ways you can look at it. You can look at it from a human perspective and an organizational perspective. And Ian touched upon the human perspective a little bit, um, but I'd like to touch upon uh, another perspective within this. So from the human perspective, uh, while I was doing a volunteer work in Africa and India, I learned that it was really easy for all of us to get the savior complex, right? We do so much and we derive so much of joy in helping someone else. But then a lot of times the mistake that we end up making is that we assume that they want to be like us because we are the saviors and we need to help them be more like us. And this is a, a rookie mistake that everybody starting out in development makes. They want to be like us. They want to enjoy the same lifestyle as us. And that is the wrong mindset to, uh, to have. We learn from them. We learn about their context, their knowledge, their belief systems. And from there, and we take all of that, and then we learn how to apply what we know from our little bubble to another context. So if anything, we learn more in the process, and we should be humbled and grateful for this rather than assume that we're helping other people. So, you know, so we are better. Don't be that volunteer who takes a picture of, you know, of, uh, you know, multiple children in his or her arm of 10 African or Indian children and then share it on, on social media. That is, again, once again, what we've started to call the savior complex and then some very crude development professionals call it poverty porn. Remember that we're all equal and we're helping, we are definitely helping someone else, but then they are also helping us and it is, it is mutual learning. That's the human perspective. Now coming to a career and organizational perspective, when you work in development, you could work in so many different areas and all the panelists are a very, you know, are a testament to that. You could work in a social enterprise. You could work in the sustainability arm of a corporate job. You could work in an international organization such as the World Bank or the UN, or you could work in an NGO. And each organization will give you a very different lens on development. So I have, I have I've worked in the private sector as well as in an NGO before I joined uh, the World Bank. But when I was working for an NGO, as an example, I was very suspicious of the World Bank as a financier, as a financier of projects that, you know, 
what I felt led to environmental de degradation in India. And um, I, though I was skeptical, the other part of me felt that it might be useful to learn how the World Bank works and how we could potentially access funds from them for environmental and water projects. But when I joined the World Bank, I had you know, I realized how little I knew. It is the largest financier of environmental project globally, and it puts every dollar it spends through a safeguard lens to protect the environment and people. And it has some of the most committed and passionate people in the world working on development. So I had, and I completely turned from being a skeptic to a complete advocate of uh, the, the role that international organizations play. So, it is a real privilege to have this, to bias yourself with multiple perspectives earlier, early on, because it will help you later on in your career. So like I said, make the most of cross a cross section of experiences, get experiences across different uh, uh, development organizations. Ideally, get that experience before you join a large organization such as the UN or the World Bank. If you do get an entry level job at a large organization, make the most of the experience and leave, right? Because it's the, real, it's the real skills that you get from sitting in, um, you know, sitting and toiling in a very, very small NGO that really teaches you how to really, how to channel financing um, to the right organizations and how to channel it effectively uh, towards the right, um, towards, uh, towards different causes. Uh, and it would just make you stronger going forward. So I'll stop here for now and uh, over to you. Great, thank you so much. And I know we've had some questions about entry routes in, should we go for those large organizations early on? And really interesting to hear your perspective on that. Um, I can see Katie and Tori both would like to add to this. And originally I'd said to them, oh, we might not have time for everyone to answer every question if we get loads of questions in. But audience, you haven't asked too many questions. So I'm going to ask Katie and Tori for their perspective. It's a really interesting discussion. Um, but if you have got a burning question you've been too shy to put in the Q&A, now is a good time. Um, Katie, do you want to start us off and then we'll, we'll go to Tori after that? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I was just wanting to come in on the question about unpaid internships and that, that sort of routine, whether it's a big organisation or a smaller one. Um, and for context, when I was at CanFed, I was responsible for recruiting and training um, what, what is a paid in is a six month full time paid internship um, and people often did stay in the team and most of the team members came in that way. And I just what I really wanted to say is that you re you really don't need to be doing long unpaid internships, they are I, I think we're really getting past that I hope as a sector because it's not fair not everyone can do it and it really disadvantages some people. So what I would what I would say is that there are lots of. Um, there are skills there are free courses you can find online and I think as much as um yeah COVID and the pandemic has meant that we can all work from wherever we are I think it gives people a lot more flexibility in terms of skills you can pick up um remotely or if you can um maybe only sort of volunteer a day half a day if you need if you do find that that that's the best way for you to get some experience initially um I think as a hire you know a hiring manager I would try and see whether someone like you, you can kind of say okay maybe that person has done six months unpaid internship but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily any more committed than anyone else who hasn't done that I think you look at the person's CV as a whole and I, I, I hope that other recruiting managers take the same kind of approach now rather than just sort of looking for the person who's done the most free work. Thank you and, and Tori did you have something to add there as well? Yeah, um, I just want to echo some of the points being said around, you know, I think that caution around not speaking on behalf of others um, and sort of, you know, how it's, it's often easier to look outwards than it is to look inwards. And I think that's something that is really at the root of medical her story. And I think I'm in a unique position of having sort of started something that was built out of some of the gaps I was seeing within this industry and others. Um, you know, it's a storytelling initiative and it started with my own story of being dismissed or belittled or ignored within medicine and then it sort of grew into this larger movement around people saying you know once you start speaking out relating to it and sharing their own stories and now like I said before we're in seven different countries and it's interesting to see a lot of the issues that you might think 
are, you know, so local, you may assume, okay, well, it's due to healthcare systems being overburdened, or it's due to specific interactions uh, or cultures. But what we've seen is that issues like gender health and equity are so universal. And a lot of, you know, while the actual systems might be different, the way of operating might be different, the way you get care may be different, how patients are feeling is really similar. And I think when you can get at the heart of those issues, I think that's where there's a lot of power to sort of start from there and grow outwards when you can find, you know, amongst all the differences, some of those commonalities and work on there, you know, including people to say how they would best be served and really bring it in their lived experience and their stories. Um, and that's something that we're really passionate about. So I'm glad that was brought up in this uh, discussion as well and just wanted to add that in. Thank you, Tori. Um, and Janina. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry we're jumping back and forth a bit, but I just wanted to add a point to what Katie said um, on the unpaid internship question. Um, I really agree with, with everything you said, Katie. Um, and um, yeah, just wanted to add that I do think that internships are a valuable um, opportunity to get experience and also potentially for it to turn into a job. Like this is how I got my first job, for example. Um, but it was a paid internship and um, the unpaid internships are very common in the UN, but there are lots of organizations that do offer um, payment for that. Um, and there's also definitely um, opportunities in the private sector. Um, I know that sometimes this is not necessarily considered development, but as I think Sunira also said, there's many um, private organizations that work in areas that benefit development. So that's also definitely worth considering and there it's more likely to get a decent um, um, salary as an intern as well. Um, I think in general, in the international development sector, there's an expectation that people will accept lower salaries. And I don't necessarily think that that's justified um, because people still have the same needs as in other sectors. They'll have families, they need to sustain themselves. And so I think um, people shouldn't necessarily assume that just because they work for a charity, they also have to be um, more frugal in their, their own lifestyle, obviously not talking about um, um, extortionate salaries, but um, it, I, I think that's a tendency in the sector in general that I'm hoping it can get away from a little bit because it will attract better talent as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think often this question of kind of getting work experience, we've had a few questions come in in the pre-survey that are about you know, what advice would you give a recent graduate who's seeking work experience? Um, what would, what, how can you approach this if perhaps you've got no previous ex experience in, in this particular field? Um, and I wonder if any of our panelists would be happy to share maybe your, your early experiences. How did you get that first foot in the door? Um, I know a couple of, couple of people have mentioned that already, but uh, it'd be really interesting to hear some stories. Um, I can go on that one. Thanks, Katie. So my very first paid job for an international development organisation was at, um, it's a charity called Send a Cow based in Bath, and they needed somebody to open envelopes um, for a postal campaign for a summer. So I went and did that, um, which was actually, even actually just being in you know, the office where you're hearing people having conversations and you get to, um, you get to talk to people who have got different jobs within a charity and you get to just go and ask them about how they got there and I think that was how I first kind of recognized monitoring the evaluation as a specific kind of sector with or you know part of an organization um and really spoke to the guy who was there doing that and sort of found out about how you can use that for different organizations and that was yeah I think that was for me kind of even though I wasn't so interested in the kind of the fundraising element of working for a charity, just taking any sort of temporary job to get, get your foot in the door and meet more people. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else or anyone who from a hiring perspective has seen useful things? Uh, Janina. Uh, I, can, I can share a few different um, aspects of sort of trying to get into the sector. I was fortunate, um, I studied uh, MML at Cambridge, and so I was fortunate to have a year abroad, um, which obviously gives um, a lot of time to try out different things. Um, so I volunteered for a small NGO um, in Italy, where I was spending most of my year abroad, um, and um, it had projects both in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Latin America. 
But the way I found this organization was literally by looking up all the NGOs working in development in the town that I was moving to and emailing basically everything that looked interesting. That was a very tedious task, but it paid off um, in the end. Um, and um, this is not to say that this has to be done with, with every situation, but um, there is something to be said for reaching out to people proactively and um, sort of offering your skills, um, especially for smaller organizations that can be attractive because they need um, people to help with certain things. Um, people have mentioned networking in general. Um, I'm not personally very good at that myself, but I do know that it's um, it can be useful. Um, everyone has LinkedIn these days and sometimes um, just a conversation, um, reaching out to someone that you see that has a job that looks interesting to you and just learning more about their organization or what their day-to-day -day work um, is like can be helpful and then you make connections and it's really helpful in, in, in future applications to have connections in organizations that you might want to work for. Um, I tried this myself um, at uh, my very first job or my very first paid job, which um, I got um, through, the, through an internship scheme through uh, the University of Cambridge as well. But I basically, it allowed me to attend um, the Global Health Summit um, in Berlin at the time. And I just got talking to a couple of people and they were interested in the internship that I'd previously done in, in Geneva. And so it was, a, it was a matter of being in the right place at the right time, but it did come through connections. So unfortunately, um, often opportunities that might be for entry level um, that candidates might not always be advertised and it's useful to just get in contact with people and talk. Thank you. Um, and Sara, I can see you've got a, a hand up as well. Hi, yeah. Um, so, uh, so for someone who, for maybe a student who, who's looking to gather some experience or, or a fresh graduate who, who's looking for a job, um, you know, like the others mentioned, um, I mean, just, you know, keep looking for opportunities, you know, whether it's uh, volunteering or internships in, in various organizations, um, you know, there are lots of portals out there that you can go to um, and find there are a lot of, you know, trainee programs nowadays. Um, LinkedIn is a great, great uh, space to kind of, you know, connect with people and as well as uh, organizations and learn more about not only job postings at LinkedIn posts, but, but also, you know, a lot of times um, your connections just post about jo jobs, you know, as, uh, as, as posts, as a separate posts. Um, so, you know, that also really helps. And, and also, um, you know, while you continue to look for, for jobs and, you know, I, I know that it, it can be a tedious process. Um, I think picking up on some skills is also a great way um, to, to, you know, kind of, um, I mean, obviously not gather experience, but, you know, uh, it, it's, it's good to kind of pick up on skills that can be useful, um, you know, in your internship or in your future job, you know, for example, obviously, depending on your interests. Um, and what you intend to do in the future. Uh, but, you know, for example, data analysis skills, um, you know, a lot of uh, skills in the tech space um, that are, are, are very connected to the international development sector, um, you know, GIS or big data or, you know, AI. And there are a lot of courses um, on, you know, Coursera, edX, um, and you can literally pick up anything that you're interested in, like, you know, climate change or, or SDGs or anything. Um, and, uh, I mean, I mean, that can definitely add value, um, to, to your skills. And, and I mean, when, you know, you add that to your CV, I mean, I'm sure, um, uh, employers will also, you know, at least they'll, they'll see that, you know, you, you, you're, you're interested in this and it, it might just, you know, connect with them somehow. So, um, yeah. And, and also, um, I think when you're looking for for jobs um, or or um, you know opportunities while you're studying, um, I think it's maybe good to kind of do a little bit of research and try try and identify um, what particular sectors you're interested in, and that could be education, um, uh, employment, uh, water and sanitation, health, gender. You know there are a lot of fields that you can choose from, so maybe it's good to kind of um, try and identify which ones you're interested in, which ones you'd like to gather some experience in. And also different, there are different functional areas um, like, you know, research and analysis, policy work, project management. Um, so maybe also try and see what is out there and what you'd like to, you know, 
uh, go for. And by saying that, I, I mean, having said that, um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to know uh, what particular se sector or functional area you'd like to be in. Um, I mean, that's something that even I'm still figuring out, you know, along my career. But uh, I mean, it's good to have maybe some idea or just, you know, try and, uh, you know, come up with something that could kind of guide your career path. Uh, thank you. And I think um, this is making me think I, I won't talk about careers theory. That's not what we're here for. But there is a careers theory about crafting career experiments where you do something you, that you find interesting and then maybe a little sideways move to something else that's similar and you kind of see it as a forging your path rather than plan it, planning it all out in advance and then following it. Um, Ella. Yeah, I think really sort of building on what you've of literally just sort of um, said, um, I think sort of it's good to get experience in international development NGOs or international development organisations, but um, you can get experience in, in other types of organisations as well and the skills that you learn in those roles or where it's, whether it's, it's volunteering or internships or a sort of first job will be useful across the board. Um, so personally, I've done sort of internships in in quite different organizations not all sort of international development things um i did a sort of short internship in, in urban planning i did a sort of longer six month internship in, in sort of education programming with uh, nesta which is a sort of innovation foundation in london um which is very uk focused not internationally focused at all but a lot of the skills i sort of learned within that about um how sort of funds are managed and even sort of simpler things like report writing and um, have been really useful in in my job, which now is is sort of working with international development organisations. Great, thank you. And that perhaps picks up. We've had a question about sort of transferring in from a, a different job that someone had asked in the Q and A. And in that case, it was consultancy. But you know, I think you can get experience in such a different range of things, but it can all come together, as you say, with those transferable skills and experiences. Um, Sinira, you had your hand up and it's disappeared. Is that because Ella? Kind of covered what you were going to say. I think I accidentally put my hand up. Um, Easy to do. But, yeah, apologies for that. Uh, but this was more to answer the question on whether it's easy to transition from management consulting to the international development sector. And um, my answer to that is yes, provided you also show a demonstrated interest in development. So uh, I Immediately after graduating, my first job, I spent three years in the private sector working on supply chain management. Um, but my, in my undergrad degree, I had showcased, uh, I'd shown demonstrated interest in development and I'd done a lot of development related internships while, um, while I was an undergrad. Uh, I was a student of economics back then. Um, so right after that, uh, there was a social enterprise in India that was looking for very specific skills that I learned in my job in the private sector. And uh, they were looking for someone with uh, adequate experience in business development, finance, like a broad range of experience and, you know, ex uh, financial modeling, et cetera, which is, which is where, uh, which is basically what I could bring to the table. So that was how I could make the transition. So despite you know, spending the first three years of my career in the private sector. Um, then when I went and did, when I did my master's, um, the thesis that I worked on was on sanitation. And I, uh, again, worked, I was, I linked my thesis to a um, research paper with the World Bank, and that sort of helped uh, get my foot in the, in the door. Now, getting into an international organization is not easy. So I got a foot in the door. Everyone knew my name, but when I graduated, I didn't get a job. Um, I did get more experience working in an NGO uh, in the water uh, at the uh, nexus between uh, development and climate. Um, and then after that, I was offered, um, I was offered a consultancy at the World Bank. And uh, that was my real foot in the door. When I uh, when I worked, when I started off as a consultant, my um, there were several things that I then understood about, uh, you know, really uh, what international organizations are looking for. The private sector experience helped greatly because it provided a perspective that a few other people in the organization could give. And the fact that I had spent a substantial number of years working uh, on a particular sector, I think this was mentioned earlier, having 
sectoral, I, I think Zara mentioned that, having sectoral expertise is something that's extremely valued in international organizations. Um, and it could be in any sector, it could be in water, it could be in education, it could be in climate, but you need to also show fungibility. So it's almost like a T. So after a few years, and, I, and, I, and I'm emphasizing this again and again, working as uh, joining, in, joining an international organization immediately after an undergrad is uh, an undergraduate degree or with the minimal years of work experience is something that I wouldn't recommend at all. You're not going to get most of the experience and they're not going to value you and you're just going to sit and be frustrated. They will value you once you bring, once you've worked uh, for a certain number of years uh, across different, um, you know, either in the NGO or in the private sector and a combination of the experience would be extremely valuable. And then if you could bring what they, what they refer to as the T, which is deep sectoral expertise, and that's the vertical part of the T, and then a broad set of experiences, which is where the, your, your private sector experience would come in, right? Are you fungible across the organization with a particular, with, with depth in one particular area? Uh, at least from the World Bank perspective, this is something that they value a lot. And a lot of people, I think the sweet spot, the age is usually around 30. Um, well, I would say once you turn 30, that would be the time when the World Bank would value you as much as you should be valued. And my two cents there. Sorry, still on mute. Thank you so much. Um, Janina, I can see you've got your hand up, but I also I'm conscious that Tori, you've got to leave us a little bit earlier, haven't you? Um, would you be happy just to give us your perspective before you go? And then Janina, sorry, I will come to you next. Um, because I suspect it's rather different because of course you founded your own organization. Yeah, definitely. So while I did found my own organization, I definitely was lucky enough to get some experience before going in. And I think I was able to actually just luck out in that there was a lot of student opportunities. And these are things that, you know, I'm sure the Cambridge Career Service can help you find, but just asking around, there's certain paid positions you can have as a student that are really helpful. Uh, so for example, I worked for a few years in sexual violence response and support. And I found that a really fulfilling role that really taught me a lot around storytelling. You know, that people could disclose to you as much or as little as they wanted about their own experience and that that still meant that you could help them through their healing, that you could help direct them to services and be there for them. I also was lucky enough to have some uh, jobs working within uh, global and public health that were really fulfilling, you know, as a research assistant, being in the lab, uh, conducting some of that research and connecting with communities was really fulfilling. So then when I decided that, you know, I was seeing this gap, no one was really talking about the root causes of gender health inequity. Nobody was really getting at sort of the sexism and shame within healthcare and the way that I thought it was important to do so. And I think those prior experiences helped in the way that you know, I knew the power of storytelling and I knew the power of community and I was able to bring those together to create something new. So I think definitely if you are interested in international development and you think there's a gap, uh, definitely I would say go for it and founding it. Um, I think it's a really fulfilling opportunity, but again, not without its own challenges. Um, and I think you can also, you know, have uh, full-time positions with big co corporations and still be creating change in your own way in a smaller level as well. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. I know you, uh, you've got a few more minutes with us, but um, you won't be able to stay right to the end, but I find it really interesting to, to hear from you. And thank you, Janina, for your patience as well. We're kind of moving you down the, down the agenda there. Um, no, not at all. Um, yeah, I was um, just going to add uh, one small point on the question of management consulting. Um, I certainly know many former management consultants I have transitioned into jobs in the international development sector and I think those skills are certainly very transferable I'm not going to repeat what Sunira said um, but I think it's also important if you have just been working in a management consulting firm for example to get some exposure to um, a developing country context if that is where you would like to work of course there are also positions working from um, the Western world, say, um, where you don't really spend that much time there, but um, if you're going to have a more hands-on job um, and you've never spent time in a developing country context, it's really valuable to try that out first. Um, also, because it probably gives some exposure to different working styles of um, organizations that work on the ground, which 
are often very different um, from how a management consulting firm works. It's a less, lot less structured. Um, there's a lot more um, uh, things that maybe don't go according to plan and, and a lot more um, flexibility involved. And so it, it helps, I think, um, getting used to that. Um, I could maybe say a couple of words on the other question that was just um, posted about um, feeling underqualified for job descriptions. Um, I would say that's uh, something that continues even after you're a graduate, um, whenever you apply for jobs. Um, in, in my opinion, and also in my experience as a hiring manager, I think the list of requirements, um, if it's structured well, you have the essentials and then you have the desirables and you can see what's the sort of full wish list and what's um, a realistic expectation, but no one is ever going to tick all the boxes or in very few cases. Um, so I think it's also important to look at the job description um, itself and see what the tasks involve and ask yourself, can you do that? Um, and if you don't really know, or if you don't really understand, going back to my previous point, it's really helpful to just talk to someone and ask them about it in the organization, not even to ask them for that job, but to find out what that job would actually look like and to evaluate whether you could um, do that. Um, and then I think what I found useful um, for maybe jobs that I really want to do, but I don't feel fully qualified for is also going back to Tori's point about storytelling, try and think a little bit about what you want your own narrative to be and, and create a story around that and see how everything that you've done um, can contribute to that in some way, even if there's not a lot of work experience, there's always something I think that um, you can find that you've done that would have contributed to your ability to, to do that job. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is just music to my ears as a career consultant, because I think there's so much that can be done with an application to help an employer see how, how you fit that role and, and what your story is. It's really valuable. Um, Ian. Uh, yes, just picking up on, on a few things that have been said. Um, as as Afrinspar, I've been sort of operating in Cambridge for about 10 years with, with a local office here, and also making many trips to, to Africa. And a lot of people of uh, students, particularly who have come to see me and have been involved with Africa in different ways. So some have been on visits to Africa with me a lot, actually, and quite a lot have come and volunteered in our office. Now, we are, are running a small charity. So basically, we haven't been able to pay lots of people, but there's quite a number of people who've come and worked for us where they've been um, supported in some way or other, particularly Vodafone for quite a while, we're offering sponsorships. Um, that was, you know, they stopped doing that, unfortunately. So we had quite a lot of Vodafone World of Difference award winners come and uh, work with us. And people have volunteered in our office for anything from a week to, to like eight months. When I say volunteers, some of those have been like paid um, internships. Um, but what I've found is that uh, a lot of people have approached me I don't even need to do anything. People will just contact and want to get involved. The issue is finding the right sort of fit. And I think anyone who's interested can go out looking for organizations that appeal to them and they can approach them. And even if you can just simply go and have a chat for an hour, I would say I've had a lot of what I call career chats and people will come in and you know just explore. I can explore with them what they're thinking of, what they want to do and so on. And out of that, we'll will come something, you will help that person move forward in their thinking. Um, and occasionally you find a fantastic fit between what you're doing and, and what they're aspiring to. Um, so I, I think there's a whole like experimental sort of area, particularly when you're a, still a student or immediately after graduation where people are still trying to work all this out and getting small opportunities in at different organizations is the way to start to build your CV. Some people get to the end of uni and they've already got an amazing list of things they've done, you know, and there can just be things you've done within the student world. Um, but they're, they're what you can build on. And I think every what you're doing in those early years is building the platform wherever you can get to. That's your platform for the next step. And I concur with this idea that the big jobs in international development happen when people are 30 and the routes they take to get there are many and varied. I would say somewhere in those first few years, you need to get some sort of hard skill. Um, so I've got one person I know in my own family, actually, who at one point stopped what they're doing, made what looked like a sideways move, but they went there to get project management skill. And when they got that, they re-entered the international development field. So, it's some, you know, you've got to somewhere find that hard skill. And one of the issues for Cambridge students is many are doing quite generalist degrees. Um, 
is obviously not if you can become a doctor, maybe if you become an engineer, there's some uh, subjects which, which give you harder skills perhaps, but many don't. And that's what you've got to try and find somewhere in those early, early years. Um, but I think this, this trying to find a fit with your, your interests into the organization, you need to just strike lucky with the person you go to see that, that, you know, that you click. And, and that's very important in your jobs as well. If you, if you can get on with the people that you're working with or working for, that, that is how you can make a lot of progress. Um, so that, that's just a little bit of a, uh, and I think management consulting, yes, very easy to move into international development because you've got some very solid skills there. You just need to find the right place where you can sell them into uh, an organization. Thank you so much. Really interesting to hear. And uh, uh, we're coming towards the end. So I'm going to just give our panelists a heads up that I might ask everyone at the end just to finish with perhaps a highlight from your career, something that you enjoy about your current job or something you're, you've done in the past that's been a particular kind of something you're proud of or interested in. While you all think about that, um, absolutely really nice to hear from a few of our panelists. You know, often I think students are quite worried about getting in touch with someone, this very formal word we use of networking. Um, will I be a bother? What do I say? But um, so really nice to hear from Ian and, and some of the others about how it's actually quite nice to be contacted and, and how willing you are to talk to, to students with questions and, and support them. Um, I'm also going to put um, our survey in the chat um, for our students. It would really help us out if you could, at some point after our panelists have spoken, fill that in and let us know um, what we can do to kind of support you in the future. Um, does anyone, is anyone a, a really quick thinker wants to kind of start us off with that career highlight or uh, thing that you enjoy about your job particularly? If not, I shall just go through a list. Ella. Hi, yeah, this is maybe slightly left field, but um, something that I actually, because I'm a fairly recent graduate, something I was actually involved with at was at Cambridge on which I've sort of continued to be a part of now it's sort of a side project to my main job was I was involved with um these uh, it's called the Cambridge Development I teams which is run by the Centre of Global Equality um and uh it's based, based in Cambridge but it was all uh, virtual when I was doing it during during Covid um and I find that uh, a sort of really interesting thing to get involved in and that's something I do spend a bit of my time still contributing to now it's this sort of program where you sort of get paired with the University of Cambridge project or a project that's based in Cambridge um, to, to get involved in some way. They're, they're really sort of varied, but that's something I still do in my sort of day to day is I'm still involved in this project that I was working on, which is a sort of um, biotechnology project for uh, making an antiviral product for use in, in developing regions. Um, but that's something that that has sort of been a, a highlight for me over the last few years is being involved in with, with these other sort of development projects as well as um, my main job and using the sort of knowledge of the international development sector in uh, this sort of smaller project. Great, thank you. And as you're at the top of my list, I am going to go through the through in programme order again. So Zara, would you mind uh, your, your passing words um, for us? Yeah, um, so so generally, I think, um, I'm not sure if this counts as a highlight, but um, kind of seeing myself evolve, maybe, and see how, you know, where I started off and the, the various skills that I learned, um, and so much that I've learned, and, you know, from where I started, where I didn't really know anything about the development sector, um, and then my first job, and, and yes, there was one particular highlight where, um, uh, something really small actually uh, but so when in my first job I, I started proposal writing uh, something that I didn't know of before that um, and um, you know I you know drafted a few proposals and then there was this one time where you managed to secure a World Bank project and you know um, I mean I was really proud of myself <laughs> and uh, I mean it, it was something that you know I could really look back to and you know say that oh uh, I helped this organization you know get this project and um, so yeah that was a highlight for me in in that particular job and it really you know boosted my confidence so yeah thank you so much and um, Katie 
Yeah. Um, so I think one particular highlight in my last role at CAMFED was we were doing a really large scale evaluation. So baseline, midline, endline research surveys. And as part of that, I was tasked with making sure that the research we were doing was more accessible to students who had disabilities. So doing the research for that, adapting the tools, um, training the enumerators in how to, to, to make those adaptations, um, which was really rewarding. One for the feedback that we got of people saying, oh, brilliant, I've got you know large font um, tool survey to fill out now. We didn't have that before, really, even simple stuff like that. Um, and then also knowing that we got like just the data that we had was better because it had more people involved and the people whose voices like should be there were now there. Um, so that's kind of like one specific thing. And then I think more generally, so I've always worked in sort of small and medium charities and I've just worked with so many like diverse, really talented people, um, which I think from the outside, you might not always assume would be the case, but that's been, that, that continues to be a highlight for me. Thank you. That's great to hear and, and always nice to have a kind of shout out for those smaller organisations that people don't always think of or maybe they just haven't heard of or, or considered. Um, Janina. Yeah, um, I think um, I'd mention um, my experience um, working in East Africa for an organisation called One Acre Fund, which is um, an agricultural social enterprise. Um, and I was responsible for managing government relations in various countries, but it was an exciting time to be part of the organization um, while it was growing very fast. And so there were additional programs in new countries that were being opened. Um, and I was responsible for essentially paving, opening the government relations team in Uganda and paving the way for that program to be established. Um, so I got to sort of build the systems from scratch, get government support and, and hire a team to do all of that with them together. Um, and, and we sort of paved the way um, to um, enable this program to start with a couple of hundred farmers and grow into a stable program of about 12,000 or so. Um, so that was a really rewarding um, thing to be doing and really exciting because everyone, there was a lot of energy and I got to sort of see it through from the start and do it, doing it with a local team um, was really energizing as well. Very much reminds me of what Ian was saying at the beginning about finding that kind of positive energy from, from people as well. Um, and Ian, you're next on my list. Um. Actually, there's so many things I could mention, but if I just pick one that's been recent, um, over the course of time, we helped establish three different uh, teams of local people in Uganda who were um, protecting springs and building boreholes and, and constructing water tanks. Um, and that's really been a successful program. And then 18 months ago, we tried to lift that idea and move it to Zambia. And... Um, and trained some young men who, who were just unemployed young men with no experience. We found one experienced person from uh, Luxark, an older gentleman who understand, understood these hand, hand wells, you know, how to hand pumps, how to fix them, how to make these shallow wells. And uh, these young men learned how to do that. And then they've been constructing new wells and also been repairing so many. And, and they've found so many that are like not working. Um, and they've become so good at this that people come from other districts trying to learn from them. But it, it's just a, a, a program that, that's taken off. And, and it's a delight to me because I'm all the time hearing from them. They're sending me photographs of what they're doing today. Um, and it, it involves water and sanitation. So they're, they're just very busy at the moment constructing the train slabs so that a whole community can have bitter trains. And these are people who've been displaced by flooding the lake. And they've come to live on the mainland and they're just building their houses out of mud. And so when you look at the population that they're actually serving, um, but it's just an exciting thing. You know, it's, it's a dynamic thing. It's happening every day. Um, the issue is how, how much funding can I plough into supporting them? But it's done with local contribution and our contribution. So all the time, the, the, what's happening is the, the, the people there are learning how to actually motivate them, mobilise themselves to do it. And all we're being is a catalyst. And interestingly enough, it's a, it's a girl who was supported by CAMFED um, and came to Cambridge in 2012. And I met her here and she maintained contact. And she's the one who's driving all of this forward on the ground. So it's quite an interesting um, bit of linkage. Although this is, you know, once CAMFED, once the students finish school, that's it. They have their own network of, of, of girls who've been supported. 
uh, and they interact in their network, but um, CAMFED stops at, I don't know, age 18. So uh, it's been quite exciting uh, working with this young lady who's very dynamic and, um, uh, and the young men, you know, who've all learned what to do. So that's just a highlight for me at the moment that, that that's going on. Great, thank you, Ian. And this is the, the danger of being at the bottom of the, the programme. Unfortunately, Sunira has had to go kind of on the dot for seven o'clock. So um, we don't get to hear her highlight, of which I'm sure there are many. Um, thank you so much to all of our panellists. I've really enjoyed listening to you and, and hearing all your perspectives. I'm, I'm sure our students will have got a lot from it as well. And, and hopefully you've enjoyed listening to each other um, along the way. Um, really very much appreciated. If we're in person, I'd be asking the students to show their appreciation by giving you a round of applause. Um, that's much more difficult online, but um, I'm sure they would share their thanks as well.